Greetings and welcome, class. This is week three of CIS 4670, Network Security. And we are going to go into monitoring and diagnosing networks this week. So monitoring is a very key task to security um, procedures. Uh, if you can't monitor a network, you don't know that bad things are happening to a network. So last week we talked about risk and what it meant uh, to have risk in an environment and how we manage risk and mitigate it or accept it, et cetera. Uh, this week basically monitoring is about watching to see if those risks occur and what we can do about uh, fixing or how we say, uh, not fixing, but how? what do we do if we see a risk occurrence happening in real time? So that said, let's go ahead and jump in. All right. So please review your terms on page 47. There's a few of them that they go over. Uh, honeypot, HoneyNet, uh, DMZ, Demilitarized Zone. Uh, information Security Management System, ISMS, uh, Software Defined Networking, Stateful Packet Inspection, and uh, Intrusion Detection System, Intrusion Prevention System. It seems like it's IDS IPS week in both of my classes. Uh, also, uh, SEAM, maybe uh, Incident and Event Monitoring, Security Incident and Event Monitoring. That's a very big uh, platform that's uh, in the industry is a big thing these days. But basically, we're going to look at cases and the purposes for using different frameworks and different guidelines and best practices to ensure or that help us to ensure that we have a secure environment. Now, these frameworks and, and practices, and they're, they're only as good if you follow them and you have actual practices that follow them. Anybody can write anything down on paper. That's really easy to do. But following through is the hard part. So as far from a Security Plus certification perspective, uh, given a scenario, implement secure network architecture concepts. So basically, the questions on the Security Plus exam will present a like a paragraph, a scenario. It will give you a... Uh, example and say, hey, how, how do you fix this? Or what's the best practice that you should follow in this case? Those, how, that is how the questions are going to be presented to you on the exam. So given a scenario, again, implement secure system design. So questions from that perspective on the exam are going to be giving you a situation and then saying, okay, uh, put this into practice, right? Or what is best to put into practice? Explain the importance of secure staging, deployment concepts. Uh, so here we are going to look at uh, how we set up uh, an environment before we put it into production and the methodology of putting it into production. So some of the frameworks that we're going to look at, uh, ISO standards, which is like the oldest ones uh, out there, Uh, North American Electric Reliability uh, Corp, or NERC, which is very important to uh, municipal utilities, electric utilities, gas utilities, etc. The National Institute of Standards and Technology with, and Technologies, excuse me, let me say that again, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, NIST, which publishes a plethora of standards and guidelines uh, for organizations, large and small, to follow. And, and on that note, you'll see information on NIST on page 51 and 52. They just kind of break down all kinds of component parts that um, are out there. And these guidelines are all downloadable 
They come in Word docs and Excel spreadsheets and checklists. They're very useful, uh, especially for audit purposes. They, they are very well organized. And then we have the ISA, IEC uh, standards, uh, in particular the 62443 uh, standard that define the procedures for implementing uh, electronically secure industrial automation and control systems. Uh, this goes hand in hand with NERC standards a lot of times uh, because industrial control systems may not be on the utility side. It may be in manufacturing or it might be in, uh, it could be in utility, but it could also be in other sectors as well. And then we have the payment card industry standards, which from a business perspective for the CIS majors, this is the biggie. This is the one that has to be followed for anybody who is ever going to run a credit card for a customer paying for whatever. And uh, a lot of times you sign off on PCI DSS standards and 99.9% .9 of the time, you're done. All right. But if you are ever approached by Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and they say, we're going to audit your PCI DSS controls. And uh, they do happen. Uh, PCI audits uh, can occur. If they come from the payment card industry and you are deficient, you basically get you know 30 days to correct it. If you don't correct it within that 30 days, they can stop you from running and processing credit cards. It's very serious. Very, very serious. Now, typically, PCI DSS, they look at the big, big, huge companies uh, for their audits, the Walmarts, the uh, Amazons, the big e-commerce, eBay, et cetera, uh, for their audits. Do they look at, you know, mom and pop's, you know, uh, taco stand or crab shack or whatever? No, they don't. All right? They're not going to really spend... Uh, time and effort on that, but but if somebody turns in a report to PCI DSS and says, "Hey, you know, Mom and Pop's Crab Shack, they uh, uh, are out of compliance, and my credit card got stolen from them," and that can bring a lot of heat very quickly, even to a small business. So, doing a little bit of a deeper dive on PCI DSS. All right. Uh, basically, the standard build out is to build and maintain a secure network, protect the cardholder data, maintain vulnerability management program, regularly monitor and test your networks. This is through uh, penetration tests and network assessments, et cetera. Maintain a vulnerability management program. How often are you doing vulnerability management scans in the finance industry and in the banking industry? This is the proverbial religion of uh, that industry because if you can't abide by these standards, which is the cornerstone for maintaining a secure network, you're, you're done. You're out of business. Uh, PCI DSS will shut a bank down or can shut a bank down. Very seldom do you ever see that, but it can happen. All right. Uh, along those lines, let me talk a little bit about the Open Web Application Security Project, or OWASP for short. And for those of you who are in this uh, area uh, of Southern California, uh, I am really in good with the uh, Inland Empire OWASP, and I'm going to and getting more and more entrenched with the Orange County OWASP groups. Uh, this is a a great group to. Uh, share information, learn from a lot of professionals, especially security professionals, are members of OWASP groups. But basically what OWASP is, it's an international organization that helps to verify security uh, for web applications, for websites. Uh, they uh, come out with a standard every two or three years as the top ten potential um, vulnerability security uh, pitfalls. Uh, and here we have the most recent one, I think from 2017, if I'm not mistaken. And as you can see, you know, verify uh, for security early and often, uh, queries, encoding of data, 
validation of inputs that helps fight off SQL injection attacks, uh, implement identity and authentication controls. Authentication is a huge problem on websites. Protection of data, both in transit and at rest. Uh, implementation of logging and intrusion detection prevention. Leveraging of security frameworks and libraries. And how do you handle error exceptions? That's a big, 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 big issue with um, how OWASP uh, operates. So benchmarking and guidelines behind benchmarking. Um, well, we can look at services, for example, and that's a good one, uh, uh, both web and mail. And we look at how data is handled by back-end systems. Uh, such as a web service or a mail service. Uh, operating systems, uh, benchmarking and guidelines for them uh, can be, you know, basically the manufacturers come out with that. It, Microsoft is a little bit better since they control the Microsoft uh, operating system. Linux, since there's so many different distributions, it's a little bit harder, but that's typically done with the core kernel, the groups that are handling the uh, development of the core kernel. Network devices it depends on the man and as well as IoT, it depends on the manufacturer, whether it's Cisco, HP, Juniper, Dell, Westinghouse, Samsung, ViewSonic, etc., uh, GE. Uh, it, it befalls them to ensure the security controls. Now, one thing on IoT, California in the last couple of years uh, has uh, made a law that states that any IoT device must uh, have a administrative control, an administrative password that is initially set upon initialization of the device. For example, you, you go and you buy a big, huge screen TV at Best Buy. You bring it home. You plug it in. It's a smart TV. It wants to get onto your network. But first, you have to input a password. Right? And that password controls who has access to that device, which is a good thing, right? But before, a lot of these manufacturers who were not security firms, mind you, um, ViewSonic was not a security firm. Samsung, eh, they have security-centric pieces to it, but the, the folks who make the TVs, no. GE, Westinghouse, they don't have a big... Uh, security component to the development of their products. Now they have to, right? So keep that in mind. So some uh, network architecture concepts that, that go into the chapter, uh, zones and demilitarized zones. Zones are basically VLANs, virtual LANs, that are off of a firewall. And zones and demilitarized zones are, are a little confusing, Um a demilitarized zone is basically just a definition of a zone that is in between the Internet and an inside network. A zone is any of these. Any of these networks, any of these VLANs can be a zone. Um, Palo Alto Networks is really big on zones, and it's, it can be very confusing. But in essence, uh, it's a way for you to define a traffic space where traffic is coming from or going to. Um, so it's very important that you kind of understand the difference between between that. That demilitarized zone is just one zone in and of itself. Uh, extranet, that's a little bit of a typo there, I apologize. An extranet uh, and intranet uh, are basically networks that define what is internal and what is external and intranet is just basically a network on the inside of a organization a company it's typically web based internal http servers that are serving up content could be sharepoint servers etc and extranet is just like that but you're sharing it you're sharing it with a business partner or or other entity it is still closed it's not the internet. It's not free out there to everybody. It's still closed, and you might be linking to that extranet via a WAN link or a VPN. Wireless. Uh, wireless is uh, basically a type of network that you do not have a physical cable, cable on. 
Uh, it can also be part of your mobile network. Our uh, portions of wireless networks could be construed as mobile networks as well. But with technologies growing and growing and growing, that is separating more and more. Um, but in this context, wireless is going to be the 802.11 um, uh, IEEE standard uh, of wireless, where we leverage uh, different types of authentication and encryption mechanisms such as WPA, WPA2, WPA3, uh, etc. Um, they mention WEP in your book. Uh, I don't know of any manufacturer that is still pushing out WEP as a standard that you can use uh, for authentication in a wireless device. And then we have segmentation and defense in depth. So this is just basically the concept of splitting up your network, all right, your network segmentation into controllable parts. And each of these different networks will have, uh, could have different security policies, different rights, different um, procedures that they have to abide by. And say one network might have access to another network, but the, that network might not have access to the original network. You can have all different types of security policies that are controlled by the different firewalls that are segmenting the network. So the defense in depth aspect of this is basically stating that you are controlling the diversity of your network. And basically what that means is you have uh, different network controls or more network controls within your network. Endpoint security along with IPS and IDS along with the firewall, firewall that is doing egress filtering, traditional packet filtering, stateful firewalling, deep packet inspection. Uh, you can have uh, different vendor diversity within the network. So you could have a policy of using all one vendor's um, product. And I've seen that before. I've seen it work. I've seen it fail. Uh, there are other organizations that will say that they're going to go with best of breed uh, for different components. They may standardize on Palo Alto for their firewall, Cisco for their core networking, uh, McAfee for their endpoint security. I'm just pulling stuff out of my head. I'm not saying that that is the best thing to do by any stretch of the imagination, but they basically do a lot of analysis or they may go to the Internet and look at uh, Gartner reports, for example, and pick the best ones out of each individual category for different component parts. Honey pots and honey nets. So um, this is getting more and more traction. These have been around forever, for 20 plus years. But in today's environment, honey pots and honey nets are a way to traffic potential attackers into an area that is harmless. And basically, it's they're, they're fake networks and fake systems that can control uh, a potential hacker, analyze their tactics, analyze their practices, and then uh, thwart them thinking that they got you know legitimate information when in essence they got nothing. So it's a logical extension. Honey nets are a logical extension of a honey pot in that it, be, it appears to be an attractive target, but in reality, it is a trap. Think Admiral Akbar, Return of the Jedi. It's a trap. <laughs> yeah, I'm showing my age. Tunneling, uh, VPNs. So with virtual private networks, we basically uh, are able to connect an extranet uh, or uh, – remote sites to our core site, our, to, to our core business. And VPNs took off about 15, 20 years ago and really exploded. They crushed the telecommunication industry because telecom providers like AT&T and NTT and Verizon, et cetera, uh, they made a lot of money on private networking, private circuits. T1s, T3s, OC3s, etc., to connect up businesses and to connect up um, organizations via private lines. A lot of routing going on, a lot of routers. 
uh, in that type of a mix. What VPNs did is it allowed us to do that over the internet because we still had an internet connection, right? So what we had, what we did instead is we upped our internet bandwidth to support the VPNs that we were using, canceled all these WAN connections, and saved a lot of money. What did the telecom providers do? Well, basically they did the only thing they could do. They started upping their internet rates uh, of service, right? You don't think they're going to go out of business. They won't go out of business. They'll just increase their rates in one area to make up for the loss in the other. So security devices, firewalls, software-defined networking devices, intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems, firewalls, are basically those types of devices that block off uh, access to um, the internet or to the inside of our network. Uh, it's your first line of defense into a network, basically. And uh, they come in different types of uh, flavors. You have your packet filter firewalls, your proxy firewalls, and your stateful packet inspection firewalls. Packet filters are just that. They look at header information in a packet, source, destination IP, source, destination port, uh, protocol type, UDP, ICMP, TCP, etc. Flags that are in those types of, of headers. And they make uh, filtering decisions based on that information. Proxy firewalls basically control access into or out of an environment by proxying uh, that connection. Uh, it can be very powerful to monitor someone's traffic if you go through a proxy. Stateful packet inspection. This is t primarily done on egress uh, connections uh, where we track TCP connections, and stateful packet inspection only works with TCP. Uh, it basically looks at um, the state of the connection, who you're connected to, in order to prevent hijacking from occurring. And then software-defined networking, which is really on the rise. Uh, it, it's the the new kid on the block, if you will. It's a um, trend that can be useful both in um, placing security devices and segmenting networks. Uh, I worked on a SDN project for a mid-sized municipality, and it was a very interesting project to work on. A very hard project to work on because the technology at the time uh, was not completely 100% baked and uh, the manufacturer, in this case Cisco, um, had a lot of bug revisions to do. Intrusion detection systems and intrusion prevention systems, the main thing here is know the difference between the two. Intrusion detection systems basically work off of signatures and um, basically are network-based detection. You can have host-based detection as well, uh, but it cannot do anything. It basically monitors and alerts. An intrusion prevention system can do everything that an intrusion detection system can, but can also take action. Uh, it can go and do deep packet inspection as well. Okay, well, it looks like we went through all the firewalls. <laughs> I kind of uh, skipped over that one. Sorry about that, everyone. As well as SDN. Um, it has a lot, again, there are very few standards and a very few manufacturers in SDN as well. All right, again, know how IDS and IPS differs. I guess I did kind of skip through that pretty quick. I apologize. All right, and finally, we have secure system design. So in setting up a secure architecture, you ha there are many aspects that you have to look at. Uh, hardware and firmware is your first set. So where am I getting my BIOS? Where's my CMOS coming from? Where's my chipset coming from? And that kind of sounds really trivial because, oh, I just buy all this stuff off the shelf. Well, if you are trying to build an inherently secure component parts system, you need to know where you're sourcing your chips, your chipsets from? What is the potential for firmware flaws? What is the potential for embedded code to be in them? All right, uh, case in point, I worked on an audit several years ago uh, for a SCADA system that was being built for Southern California Gas. 
and I had to go all the way out to Cleveland, Ohio, to the manufacturer of the meters that went on your uh, the gauges for your for your gas systems that go on your house. And I had to audit with a team of scientists and professionals uh, the security complexities and controls that were being built in. And one of the first things that we looked at, actually it was the first thing that we looked at, was where are you getting your chips from? Where are you, where are you sourcing uh, your silicon? And it was fundamental. And this happens not just in this industry. It happens in the Defense Department as well because who's a, a major supplier of chips? China, right? And basically, this is a, a big win for them because they sourced their chips, but all of their chips were, I believe, EE Prom. And EE Prom, uh, for you hardware fanatics out there, uh, is erasable electronic read only memory, uh, programmable read only memory. Um, and EE Prom can basically just be blanked, all right, uh, with uh, certain processes. Uh, either using UV light uh, or uh, electrical reset, and once that's done, then you then it's completely programmable by uh, whoever you know by whomever. So what they did is they sourced all of their uh, chips, they flashed them there at their facility, and started from scratch. Even though that they were blank, and you know, 99.9999999999 percent of the time they were blank. Actually, they said they'd never gotten a chip that wasn't from their supplier. Um, they flashed them anyway. It was just a control. Uh, operating systems. Uh, these come in many types, but the two that you will be most familiar with will be Windows and Linux. And basically, from a secure design concept. Uh, baselining your operating system, having a baseline set up for them. Is your firewall on? Is it is all your patches in place? Do you have a uh, uh, permissions set on your local admin? Is your local admin controlled? Uh, things of that nature. That's the type of stuff that we are looking at from an operating system perspective uh, in design. Patch management. This is pretty simple. Do we have it? Do we not have it? That's the first question. Second question is, how do we control patch management? And patch management, most of the time, is controlled via change control. And patch management may happen one, once or twice a month, and it will be rolled out systematically. So we may roll it out in our uh, development environment first. And then in a week or two after it's ran, there's no problems, then we can roll it out into production. So it's a process. It's a lifecycle management process that occurs with, um, uh, with patch management. And it, you have to have procedures. If a patch fails, what do I do? How do I roll it back? How do I retest it? How do I communicate to the manufacturer? And it's not, it's not Microsoft patches. There are other applications that have patches that we have to apply and roll out. Secure configurations. This is the one that really gets people because most of your really big uh, breaches that have happened in the last few years either come from a patch not being applied or from a configuration that is not secure. A weak password, an open port, uh, something of that nature. Uh, where we have not followed good lockdown procedures, good hardening procedures on components such as routers, switches, APs, or even operating systems for that matter. And finally, uh, peripherals. Uh, peripherals are important to lock down as well. Uh, they mention Wi-Fi cards and access points, but I see that along with uh, infrastructure. Uh, printers. Uh, are notorious for being hacked, and we need to uh, ensure that um, we uh, lock them down or lock them out or filter out their management console to uh, uh, those folks who only need access to it uh, and things such as that. Also, simple things such as how do we access all this infrastructure, and it's not just peripherals, but everything. 
uh, such as via SSH, uh, RDP. Uh, where do we have access to RDP from? How do we control that access? All right? Are, do, are we ensuring that we have Telnet shut off and can't use Telnet? I think in, think in the next five or so years, you're gonna you're gonna stop seeing Telnet entirely. It's just it's you're, you, that component's just not gonna be on a system at all. And then we have secure staging. Secure staging is basically how are we deploying um, the systems? How are we deploying the programs? How are we de deploying uh, the applications? Have we thought it out? Do we have a plan? There's a right way and there's a wrong way to do it. Obviously, the right way is to have a plan. Be methodical. Uh, be very deliberate in the way that you are deploying a system, a network, an application. Have a rollback plan. If something goes wrong, okay, how do we get back to status quo? How do we get back to our uh, main state, our original state? Um, and it can take time. And this is where a lot of uh, companies and a lot of organizations really kind of roll the dice. Because they want to get stuff in as fast as possible because they don't want to pay the integrator. They don't want to pay whoever is deploying this uh, for too much time, right, because time is money. But if they do it wrong and they do it fast and it fails, well, they're going to be losing money anyway because it's not working. So it's a real fine line there. It's really conceptual. Uh, it's a hard one to gauge. So, uh, summing up uh, Chapter 2 here, and uh, we discussed how to design and implement a network in such a way as to enhance security. And we also looked at issues such as network security standards, segmentation, and defense in depth as key concepts. Uh, finally, we examined firewalls and VPNs in different uh, areas and how to implement these devices and stage them, and introduced you to fundamental security devices such as honeypots and honey nets, as well as intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. So understand devices and the infrastructure. It's very important to understanding how they are placed within the uh, organization and what role they they play. So uh, for your exams that are coming up, both your midterm and the security plus exam uh, uh, in general, uh, be able to describe the standards that we talked about, be able to explain the purpose of a honeypot and a honey net, be able to explain uh, operating system and device hardening and what goes into it, and be able to explain and apply network design and configuration, those uh, case studies that we talked about uh, earlier, that's very important as well. And that's kind of some of the hardest concepts to uh, to, to get to. So uh, just briefly here, going back to uh, we're in week three. You have a quiz at the end of the week. I will make sure that that is up and running. Uh, matter of fact, let me do that right now as we sit here. And... I believe this is my online class. This is you guys. Anyway, you know what? I will do this as I'm encoding, and so you don't have to sit here and watch me. Uh, anyway, that's going to do it for week three. You have a quiz at the end of the week, uh, and uh, please don't forget about that. So until next time, I'm going to sign off for now. This is Professor Brown. We'll see you around.